Good morning. Tim, Jimmy, and I are humbled to serve this congregation, and we want to thank each of you for your dedicated service to the Lord Jesus Christ. This church belongs to Jesus, and we are merely servants, performing our duties here as shepherds to this flock to the best of our ability. As we begin a new calendar year, we want to introduce our theme for 2018, and we approach the work that lies ahead with great enthusiasm because it's for our master, whom we love, having first loved us. The source of our theme for 2018 comes from the life that Jesus led while on the earth. In 1 John 2, 5 through 6, it reads, But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. You see, our master did exactly as he preached. He followed the will of the Father perfectly in all things. All of us in this congregation want to love, want the love of God to be perfected in us, and we want to be confident that we are in Christ. When we keep his word, we have the love of God perfected in us. We know we are in him, and we should walk just as Jesus walked. Our theme this year is becoming like Christ. And we achieve this by walking as he walked. And you'll see this slide used throughout the year to remind us of our focus on becoming like Christ this year. So that won't be unfamiliar to us. Uh, notice here it's walk as he walked there in the background as well. There are three other passages we want to share that also describe this idea of walking like Christ walked or becoming like Christ. First of which is Ephesians 5, 1 through 2, which reads, Therefore be imitators of God as dear children. And walk in love, as Christ also loved us and had given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. Walking like Christ involves walking in love. And no one has shown greater love for us than Jesus himself, who gave himself for us. There is a purpose behind our being called to obey the gospel and become followers of Christ. It's not as if we obey the gospel and then have nothing left to do or we retire to a life of ease, we have the remainder of our lives to follow after the example that Jesus has left for us to follow. This includes suffering for the cause of Christ. Part of walking with Christ is suffering as a righteous person, as Jesus did. We read in 1 Peter 2.20, and I'll read on from 2.20 to get to 21 here. For what credit is it if when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. And in verse 21, For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps. We want to follow in his steps this year. And finally, the commendation given to the Thessalonian brethren, we want to be said of each of us here at West Main Church of Christ. 1 Thessalonians 1, 6 through 8, verse 6 says, And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit. Now listen to the rest of this passage in verse 7 and 8 in 1 Thessalonians 1. So that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith toward God has gone out so that we do not need to say anything. This year, we want God to witness us becoming more like Christ, walking as he walked, truly becoming disciples of Jesus. We want our faith toward God to go out to all and be visible to all. Part of accomplishing this is taking on the virtues that Jesus exemplified in his life. Tim is going to introduce some of those virtues now. Uh, that we'll be studying, and then Jimmy will introduce some of the monthly goals that we've uh, put forth for us to use in helping us become more like Christ. So the elders believe that one way to strengthen our Christian walk is to focus on only one virtue or a few virtues of Christ at a time. So the sermon topic for the first Sunday of each month will be just to focus on one of those virtues of Christ for that month. Ken and Ben's sermons will be highly practical in nature so that we can all gain the most possible to strengthen and support our walk with Christ. 
some of the virtues and characteristics that we will study are found in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5-7. through 7. Peter says here, But also, for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. Ken and Ben will also draw from the inspired writings of Paul found in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through 26, where we see the fruit of the Spirit listed. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And we continue on in verse 24. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. We're also going to study wisdom that is from above, that is, from God. And we can witness such wisdom demonstrated in the life of our Jesus Christ. In, there we go. In James chapter 3, verse 17, we see the characteristics of godly wisdom. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy, and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy. These are the qualities of the nature of Jesus Christ that we should improve, we should strive to grow in, to become more like Christ, especially as we focus on that as our central theme this year. So in summary, here are the traits, the qualities, and the characteristics that are all demonstrated by Jesus Christ that we'll study together this coming year. It's difficult to limit our study just to 12, but we only have 12 months in the year to focus on this particular important theme. So as mentioned, we'll, we believe focus is the key to becoming more like Christ. These 12 virtues selected are joy, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, moral excellence, willing to yield, and full of mercy. So how are some practical ways that we can continue to move forward in, in our goal for this year? First of all, you know, practice exhibiting the selected virtue each day for a month. Whether you're a person who uses sticky notes on the mirror in the morning to keep that in your mind for the day, or you put reminders on your phone, whatever the case is, keep that in your mind on a daily basis for a month and practice each virtue. Also, pray. Pray for God's help in becoming like Christ. Also, as, as alluded to, the first uh, sermon of each month will be on understanding the selected virtue, and then there will be a second sermon on practicing that virtue each month. Also, as our daily Bible reading is, is working through, make it a goal to read through the entire New Testament in 2018. Stay involved in the daily Bible reading. If you get behind, catch up. But just make that a point to stay in the Word on a daily basis. The scripture readings on Sunday morning and evening will be chosen to highlight the selected virtue for each month. And then again, make it a point to attend as often as possible. If, make sure you come to Bible class. If you have kids, make sure your kids are in Bible class. Uh, you know, not only our brothers and sisters uh, can hold us accountable and, and we can hold them accountable. We're all needed to work together to do this. And again, in, in closing, just remind us of the passage in 1 John chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Look forward to a great 2018. Thank you very much.
around the turn of the 20th century, there was a lady that was living in Ireland that lived on the seashore. She was quite wealthy but quite frugal. The people were surprised when she decided to be among the first to have electricity as it had come into her area. Several weeks, however, after the electricity had been installed, a meter reader came to her home and wanted to know if everything was working all right. And she assured them that it was, and he said, well, I'm wondering if you can explain something to me. He said, your meter shows scarcely any usage. Are you using the power? And the lady said, well, certainly. She said, each evening when the sun sets, I turn my lights on, and then I go around my house and light my candles, and then I turn them off. Now, while this story is mildly abusing, think about it. Here was a lady that was tapped into a power source, but she didn't use it. Her house was connected, but her life was unchanged. She had access, but her behavior was unaltered. And when I heard that story, I thought, how many Christians are like that lady? They are saved, but not really set apart in their daily life. There are church members who are maintaining the status quo. There are attenders whose attitudes are unaltered. They are connected, but they're not changed. They're trusting Christ for salvation, but resisting transformation. Their picture is in the online directory, but they've never developed a disciple's heart. Oh, occasionally we may flip on the switch, but too often we settle for the shadows instead of for the true light. And so as we think about the theme that the elders have set before us this year, becoming like Christ. As I said in the Bible class, it's not enough for us just to learn facts about Christ, or as Moody said, to become smarter sinners. That the challenge is for us to be changed, to become transformed, to walk in His footsteps, and seek to emulate His life. Let me add another verse of the ones that the elders suggested. Romans 8 and verse 29 one translation puts this where god knew his people in advance and he chose him to become like his son so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters other versions translate the word become as the idea of conform and it means to fashion and it has the idea to share in his likeness or as this rendering puts it to become like his son and so that is the goal that is set before us this year, to focus on Jesus and to think more and more what it become, means to become like Christ. As Tim mentioned, he set before us 12 different attributes that we're going to look at this year to be like Christ. Typically, it would be the first Sunday of each month we would take these one by one, but we decided this morning, since we have a little bit more limited time, that next Sunday I will begin talking about that. And we're going to really kind of segue from our theme last year to love more and give more. We're going to talk some more about love. But we want to look at it from the standpoint of loving like Jesus loved and how we can follow his example of love. But I want, what I want to do this morning in following up and kind of helping us think a little bit more about the practical aspects of this theme, becoming like Christ, is to think about four areas of application. That is, we look at these 12 values and virtues that we can apply these. The first area I want to think about is we become like Christ in attitude. In each one of the 12 things that we saw from the three passages put before us this morning, they all speak to attitude. When we think about attitude, we think about what Paul said about Jesus in Philippians 2 and verse 5, to let this attitude be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. And Jesus' attitude was one of a spiritual nature. His focus was on the Father. His focus was on the Spirit instead of on the flesh. He focused on heavenly things instead of earthly things. And so we think about how do we develop the spiritual attitude of Christ. I'm going to talk to more, more about that tonight in detail. But let me just summarize and say by having a heart like Christ. And to have a heart like Christ, we must be crucified with Christ. In Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, Paul said that I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. 
And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And so we think about self-denial, self-sacrifice, crucifixion. That we put to death the deeds and desires of the flesh, those things that are earthly in their nature. And when we put those to death, then we seek to live as Christ. We seek to become like Christ as we crucify the flesh. And then we seek the things that are above. In Colossians 3, verses 1 and 2, that we're told that we're to seek those things or set our affections on those things above and not on the things of the earth. To set our affection where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And so as the Hebrew writer put it in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2, let us fix our eyes on Jesus. Now, I recognize that in one sense, this is nothing new because hopefully we've been trying to do that in every theme and every sermon and every class is to think about that. But in a very special way, in a unique way, in a specific way, we want this year for us to really think about Jesus. You know, I'm reminded a few years ago of something that was popular and the initials WWJD, what would Jesus do? And that is good, and it was a good thought as far as it goes. And, of course, it became popular, it became commercialized because people had bracelets, WWJD, and all kinds of things. But maybe more important than what would Jesus do, what would I do if I'm following Jesus? And so it's good to know what Jesus would do. We're going to study in our Bible class about the life of Christ. But when I think about what would Jesus do, I need to think about what I need to do if I'm following Jesus. And it begins with attitude. It begins with having a heart like his. And then a second area of application we want to make this year is our relationships. When you look at the life of Christ, we see that a lot about relationships. Jesus oftentimes saw in people things that they didn't see in themselves. When we look at the call of the apostles of Peter and Andrew and James and John and Matthew and others, we see that he looked at them and he saw their potential. He saw what they could be and what they could become and the difference that they would make as they took the gospel to Jerusalem, Judea, and to the uttermost ends of the earth. They didn't see that in the beginning. They didn't understand that. And as you study the gospel accounts, we begin to see that. And we see some of the things that they said and did, and especially vocal Peter as he was impetuous in some of his braggadocia of what he would do and what he would not do. Think about how patient Jesus was with Peter and the other of the apostles. Jesus did all things through love as he dealt with them and as he worked with them. And so Jesus teaches us a lot about relationships. He teaches us to treat other people the way that we want to be treated. Matthew 7, 12 is often referred to as the golden rule. And certainly it is, and it's a summation of everything about relationships. And so whether we're talking about our relationship in our marriage between a husband and wife, or relationship with parents and children, or relationship that we may have as an employer-employee, or relationship with our friends and our neighbors, or relationship in our church family, that the principles that we're going to talk about of becoming like Christ and developing these 12 values and virtues apply in all of those relationships. And so it's not some kind of a theological kind of a thing that we think about, something that is abstract. It is something that is practical and is pragmatic. And so it doesn't do us any good to dissect the Greek word love and to look at all the great examples of how Jesus loved if I don't seek to walk in his steps and love as he loved and become like him. So this year we want to think about that. We not only want to think about it, we want to see how each and every one of us can become better people in our relationships and treat other people the way that we would want to be treated and the way that Christ wants us to treat others. It even goes to the point of doing good to our enemies. We're going to study in our Bible class next week from Matthew 5. In fact, Jesus said in Matthew 5 that if you love those who love you, you know, what more than you, the public and the sinners? And he says, goes on to say that we need to love our enemies and to do good, to do, do evil to us, and to pray for those that seek to harm us or hurt us in some way. 
to even do good to our enemies, those that are opposed to us, and then to make love the very badge of discipleship. In John chapter 13, in the very shadow of the cross and following the Last Supper, it says in verse 31, that when Jesus had gone out, they had left now, and he said, the Son of Man needs, is to be glorified, and God is glorified in him. And then he goes on and he says in verse 34, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And then notice 35. He said, by this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. There are a lot of things that are important. Our communion service is vitally important. We're commanded each first day of the week. To come together to worship on this day is so important. And there are so many things that we could look at. Baptism, oh my. What it stands for and what it means and what the blood of Jesus does in baptism. But isn't it interesting that the one thing that Jesus singled out when he says all men will know that you're my disciples, it's not that you've been baptized. It's not that you go to church every Sunday. It's not that you have perfect attendance, but he said that you have love for one another because love, in its essence, can be seen in the way that we treat other people and the way that we interact. And people can look at us and they can see that we're actually becoming like Christ in the way that we love. Love took on a new significance. It took on new meaning when Jesus came to this earth. And so becoming like Christ means to become like Christ in all of our relationships as we interact with others. A third thing we want to look at this year as we apply these 12 values and virtues is becoming like Christ in ministry. Jesus modeled ministry. He saw it as a mandate from the Father. He understood it as his mission in life. And we look at the various ways in which Jesus ministered to others. He said that he came into this world, Luke 19 and 10, to seek and to save the lost. He saw that certainly as his primary ministry. Luke records in Acts chapter 10 and verse 38 that Jesus went about doing good. Think of that statement. Wouldn't you love to have that as an epitaph on your tombstone? He went about doing good. She went about doing good. What a great epitaph. What a great compliment. And that's the essence of ministry, isn't it? To go about doing good. And so if we're going to apply this theme in a practical way now, to become like Christ, we need to understand, as Jesus put it in John 13, 16, verse 13, that the servant is not greater than his master. The servant is not above his master. And so that means that I need to go about doing good. The Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 said, For we're God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And so that verse speaks to the idea of becoming like Christ because we're his workmanship and we've been created in Christ Jesus. Now, Ben, I don't know if you're into the Greek or not too much. I'm kind of like the preacher said, I know a little Greek. He lives down the street from me, okay? But once in a while, brethren get real disappointed if we don't refer to the Greek once in a while. No, I know you don't. But there is a word here that, I, that people that know the Greek, but then when I read this, I thought, wow. And it's the word workmanship. And, and it comes from a word, poemain, from which we get the word poem. And it speaks of the idea of a work of art. And it's something that is fashioned by man's device. A work of art. Now think about we are God's workmanship. Not man's, but God's. We are His work of art. We have been fashioned by God. Fashioned what? To become like Christ? Created in Him to do what? To do good works. That's ministry. And so to become like Him and to walk in His footsteps, in which, by the way, it says here in this verse, that God prepared in advance. You know, you know how far in advance God prepared this? Ephesians tells us, that's right, before the world was. In eternity, in eternity, that God purposed and planned and predestined 
our salvation in Jesus Christ and that we should become like him and do good works. And so this year we want to think about ministry and apply ministry and become like Jesus in ministry. And then finally, the fourth major area we want to apply these 12 virtues is in holiness. Jesus' life is characterized by holiness. Mark 1, 24 refers to him as the Holy One of God. In Acts 4 and verse 27, Peter said he is the Holy Servant. In Hebrews chapter 7, the writer speaks of him as being the high priest for us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens. And so we might think, well, I can't be like Jesus in that regard, a holy, and yet if we thought that we would be wrong because the Bible teaches that we are called to be holy, Peter said. That we're called to be holy, sanctified, set apart, undefiled, separate from the things of the world. Peter says that we're called to be a holy nation in 1 Peter 2 and in verse 9. A spiritual nation that is a holy nation. And in verse 5 of that chapter, he says that we are a holy priesthood. And then we're referred to in Hebrews 3 and verse 1 as holy brethren. Now, it is interesting that from this word, we get the word saint. I heard a lady say one time, said, well, I'm no sinner, but I'm sure no saint. Well, now, wait a minute. You're one or the other. All right. Now, the world has captured the word saint and hijacked it to give folks the idea you don't become a saint after you're dead and someone converts sainthood. Well, it doesn't mean you're walking around with a halo over your head. It just means you're trying to be like Christ, that you're seeking to be holy that you're seeking to be pure, that you're seeking to be morally upright. Not sinless like Jesus, but holy in our attitudes, our desires, our passion, our purity of life. And so becoming like Christ issues itself in the virtues that we're going to look at this year. But as we apply those virtues, we want to look at our attitudes and our relationships, our ministry and our holiness. And when we do that, then we can indeed become like Christ. I want to close with one of my favorite stories. I may have used it before, I don't know, but I, but I like it and want to hear it again. And it's a story of the mother that was preparing pancakes for her two little boys, Kevin, age five, and Ryan, age three, and and as she began to make the pancakes, they began to get into an argument which boy was going to get the first pancake. And so the mother, being a good Christian woman, decided this was a great way to teach a spiritual lesson to these boys. And she said, now, boys, if Jesus were sitting here, he would say, let my brother have the first pancake. I can wait. And Kevin turned to his younger brother, Ryan, and he said, Ryan, you be Jesus. Now, we all kind of laugh at the childish nature of that, but isn't that kind of like us sometimes? We want other people to be Jesus. We want other people to be kind and compassionate and, and, and to treat us like that we want to be treated. We want other people to be holy and righteous. But what about you and I? What about us? God calls us to be like Jesus. And so this year, Ben and I are going to be talking about this. And we're going to be talking about it in practical, pragmatic ways that, that I can do better, that Ben can do better, that you can do better. And that we can all seek to follow in the footsteps of Jesus and become more conformed to the image of Him rather than the things of the world that beguile us in so many ways. May God bless us here this year. You pray with me a moment please heavenly father we're so thankful for this new year for this lord's day and this time that we have to come and to worship you to join together in fellowship and to be reminded of the wonderful nature of the cross and what it means to us to walk in newness of life we're thankful father that your word inspires and motivates and encourage us to reach for higher levels more noble things in this life and that we can aspire to become like on Jesus. Bless our shepherds this year as they watch for souls and lead us in that endeavor. 
Bless our deacons as they minister and serve with their own special responsibilities. Bless all that teach in the classes that your son may be exalted and students may learn to be more like Jesus. And bless those of us that will fill the pulpit and preach that we may stand behind the cross and that we might show people Jesus and that we might follow in his footsteps and help others to do the same. Bless our church family through this year of change and transition. Bless us as we seek in various ways to use our gifts and abilities and skills that we might glorify Jesus. We pray, Father, for your guidance this year. We pray for your blessing through the name of Jesus, the Christ. Amen. I'm excited about the year. It's going to be a great year in so many different ways. And I'm just glad that I can have some small part as we kick it off and have a part in it. I wonder this morning as we close and you just picked a song, I think, Come to Jesus, right? Wow, what a fitting song. Good choice. Could there be one here this morning that has never come to Jesus yet? I mean, you're, you're on the outside looking in, and, and maybe you hear the virtues and the values. That, I want to be more like that. I, I, I want to do that. Are you a Christian? If you're not a Christian, you need to take the first step. Jesus said, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. Are you one to repent of your sins, confess your allegiance to Christ, and then allow the blood of Jesus through baptism to wash away every sin, and then to arise therefrom and to take the hand of the wounded Savior and say, Lord, lead, and I will follow, and I promise you I'm going to work every day to become more like you. Would you do that this morning? Have you wandered away in fields of sin and become derelict and unfaithful in your duty to the Lord? Do you need to come back home? Do you have things of a public nature that you need to make known to your church family and let us lift you in prayer and help shoulder your burden and help you along the way? We'd love to do that. Or maybe there's just some things as you think about the lesson and the presentation this morning that, you know, there's just some things down in my life or in my heart I need to change. And maybe it's private and personal. Maybe as we sing in just a moment, you'll say a little prayer. Lord, I'm sorry for the way I've been living. I'm, I'm going to change. Help me change. Help me be more like Jesus then begin to walk that way. But if we can serve you in any way this morning, would you come right now as we stand and while we sing?